Yeah, welcome to the podcast, Marco. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> you you just had a really, me. really fun presentation about yeah. the ZX Spectrum. Yes. So, yeah, so I was, uh, I was presenting this very, very old computer. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's fu sounds funny to say that, but uh, it's been maybe 40 years now. So weird. Yeah, you shouldn't count stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, actually they were quite well built. I, I bought one uh, just to prepare for this presentation on eBay, ah, ah. and it was perfect. Still, you know, working perfectly. Wow. We're expecting to sort of like falling apart. Yes, I said no, no, no. no. It, worked, yeah, it was perfect. Not a scratch. Really yeah. nice. Yeah, I just take care of them. Yes. Yes, yeah, so they just need to be modified nowadays to work on the new newer televisions. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> because for some reason uh, they used to plug in into the antenna cable, yeah. but the new tuners are, are not strong enough to pick up the signal of the spectrum. Oh, so you need to modify it so you can plug it in into the AV. Ah, uh, yes. Uh. In. <laughs> yeah, that's also <laughs> difficult. <laughs> yeah, you don't think of the. I thought that. it would have. I, I would. I would have thought it was difficult, but it was actually mm -hmm. quite easy. Okay. Good. Yeah. You, can, you can buy that or you can solder it yourself? Or? Oh, you do it yourself. Basically, you need to detach something and connect uh, two bits. Uh -huh. So it's, it's very, very easy. Uh, it's, and I, I really liked, I mean, I liked your whole presentation. It was very packed with information. Yes. Were there lots of stuff you had to skip that you would have wanted in there? Yeah, quite a lot, actually. Yeah. I, I was uh, under the impression that I didn't have enough to say. Mm -hmm. and so easily. Yes. So then I did a, a, I was so scared that I actually did a run uh, the hour before the talk mm -hmm. and I figured out that I, you know, I skipped parts and it was already 50 minutes. Uh -huh. So I was a bit quicker mm -hmm. in, uh, yeah, in, the, in the real one. Yeah. So was there anything in particular you would have like added in if you had five more minutes? Yeah, sure. I mean, there is a whole part of the things I did uh, when I was a Spectrum developer. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a kid, you know, because uh, as a kid, there were not many ways in which you could buy games. No. Uh, if you were in the UK, you could go, I don't know, to Curry's and, and buy a game. But in Italy, yeah. uh, no, I, I would need to take the train and go to Milan and then go somewhere. But I was a kid of 14, you know, yeah. I couldn't do that. Same thing in Sweden. <laughs> yeah. So I would need to basically copy it off my friends. Mm -hmm. Or, or copy it of my friends. You know? yeah. And uh, it wasn't easy because the games were made not to be very easy to copy. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a considerable amount of time finding ways of copying mm -hmm. stuff that I shouldn't. And there, there is a lot of hacking in there, yeah. a lot of nice stuff, yeah. The, the, did you start learning that like, all by yourself? Or was there some kind of like written instructions you could find about starting to remove the well, copy protection? Or well, um, there, there were some easy ways, so the real pirates would do it uh, with this uh, external uh, interface, which was called... Uh, I don't remember. No. But anyways, you, you would just press a button, and it would save all the memory to a tape. Ah. So you just load it, press the button, and yeah. save, and it's done. And you know you bypass everything. Yeah. And the way we did it was more we took the, the, the actual loading code, and uh, modified it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. But you, and you learned that by yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this assembling, this assembling code by hand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it still feels kind of magical. <laughs> it, it, it feels magical, but uh, you do it because you have no alternative, and yeah. it's tedious. You know? yeah, yeah, I can play around with this. Yeah. I've got it right in front of me. Yeah, and yeah. some good manuals to start from. Yeah, the manuals were very important. They were very, very encouraging and full of information. Yeah. And, and the, the things you couldn't find there, you could find in other books. Yeah, I so, mean, I, I love the part that you had colored in the, in the yeah. presentation that anything you do, you can just restart and it's... Open. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, that, that is like, because, because that's actually your fear. When you open your first computer, you know, what, what I'm going to do? I'm going to break it. You yeah, know? yeah. And it's so classic nowadays. Everyone yeah. seems to fall into it. Like, maybe if I change this, I'll break something. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. It's actually possible nowadays to break it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the saddest part. Yeah. <laughs> it looks much yeah. nicer now, but it is. Yeah, perhaps you're not allowed to write, write programs from it, but yeah. you can still break it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> really sad. It breaks really easily nowadays. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, that's a strange part as well. Uh, but yeah, it was um, it was a very hand-on period. Yeah. The, the computers right before this were sold as kits, mm -hmm. uh, so you had to solder them in. And even these ones, you need to open them at some point. For example, 
the Raspberry keyboard would break after a couple of years yeah. of use, so they sold a replacement keyboard, which was a bit better, yeah. but you literally need to take off the motherboard and put it yeah. somewhere else. And in fact, the, the, the Spectrum Plus keyboard, so the new one, it also had a reset button on the side. Mm. And that, for that to work, you would need to solder that button on the motherboard directly. Ah. <laughs> and this is official Sinclair yeah. thing. Yeah. So they give you this thing and say, oh, solder it on. <laughs> yeah, it's there if you need it. You, you know, just, just do it. Soldering iron. Yeah. yeah. It, it was an age that post, but not, not too quickly because I, I realized, I thought maybe yeah, it's a spectrum and then it's just finished computers that you can't open. But I remember my first Amiga actually had at least the like printouts of the circuits and stuff in the manual. Yeah. So there was still some of that stuff hanging around, but not yeah. much after that. Like well, this. even the PCs had, had tons of it. Uh, it was a little harder to find, but if you had an, an official original PC, it had it. Yeah. It had maybe three or four 1,000 pages manuals a day. <laughs> and, um, and, and it was supremely hackable. Right? The PC was like the most hackable computer yeah. ever. It was fantastic. And uh, I, when I graduated from, from the spectrum, I graduated directly to PCs. And mm. basically, since I couldn't afford them, I, I would get the broken ones and yeah. I would need to fix them. So uh-huh. <laughs> that, that part, yeah. So uh, first repair it and then write some software for it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and fantastic PC was, was a, another great love of mine. Maybe next year. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's always room for, for yeah, I was, I was very, very, much in, in love with the demo scene that was so popular here in, uh, in Scandinavia. Yeah. Uh, I did my own little bits, of course, you know, in Italy, you know, but I was like the only one probably. Oh, so it wasn't anything like it in Italy? Uh, very, very, very little, yeah. That's kind of, kind of interesting. I wonder why, why Sweden in particular? Well, Finland also. Oh, yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah. And Germany, uh, I guess. Um, yes, but more in Scandinavian countries, I think. I have no idea. No. I, I honestly don't know. No, it's, it's so interesting because yeah. when you talk to developers here, you ask them about how they grew up. So many of them like went through the demo, the demo scene at some point. Yeah. So it feels like sort of a feature. Yeah, and, and that is the same mentality, right? So that demo scene was all about hacking yeah. um, you know, the hardware and making do stuff they shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. and, and it was nice. And it died off with... Uh, with the new graphics cards that basically was the point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's it's so much, yeah, there's so much more stuff now to, to get into on some, like, I guess I guess there's more information really, but it's not like they come with the cards you buy. They don't come and a, a lot of stuff has actually changed and I don't think it's documented anymore. Yeah. I remember even when up to, you know, when, well, up to maybe three or four years ago, when you still had biases, which nowadays are oh, yeah. FE, whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the old biases, they all had the same interface. Mm. So you could actually dig up how they worked, yeah. which uh, machine code interrupt you would yeah. need to call. Yeah. And you could potentially build your own operating system. Yeah. Right? In fact, that's how they built it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, uh, and that was really cool. And it was publicly available. There was yeah. this uh, Ralph's interrupt list mm-hmm. that you can download <laughs> from anywhere. On the web and, and and do cool stuff, but now I have no idea anymore. No, so I gotta study that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, a coworker of mine, uh, he installed uh, some flavor of Linux just a few weeks ago on mm-hmm. his new MacBook, and there was some like wishing and uh, sort of waiting for stuff because the hardware revision is so new that not everything is supported and people yeah. haven't mapped it, and then, so there is no information for certain parts of it. She yeah. feels kind of kind of strange. Yeah, it, it, it's a bit sad, right? Yeah. Uh, also, computer. I mean, the, um, uh, mobile phones tend to be the worst. Yeah, uh, yeah. They, they really have no way of, you know, no feasible way. But no, no, neither in software or hardware. It's all glued together. Yeah, it's all <laughs> literally glued together. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, I, do you think that will ever make a comeback, sort of a more open? I think it attitude. could make a comeback yeah. if it was by law. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's the point. Because a lot of this is not driven by secrecy or no. by any real necessity. It's driven by the fact that people want to make uh, hardware that you need to throw away once mm-hmm. once it's broken. Yeah, um, and so and so at least the European Community, European Union, is looking into making this illegal. 
Yeah. Yes, the right, the right to fix. Yeah. 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 Uh, the right to, you know, yeah. to. Yeah, they have some good ideas. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and once that is in, then it's very likely that we will have a sort of a shared thing, which yeah, you know. like a document repository somewhere. Yeah, it will be huge, <laughs> yeah. huge files to download. Yeah, and, and it's a bit weird because you know, with all the innovation that happens as well, uh, but there are some things that will never be the same. Like uh, now, you have all systems on a chip, right? Like mm -hmm. Arduino is like a yeah. literally a chip, or uh, the Raspberry Pi as well. And those things, I don't know what you can do. Right? No, no, but at least they're small, so they may be easier to. It might be possible to grasp more of them than on your desktop PC. Uh, probably, probably. But even on the desktop PC, in reality, uh, you can do a lot yeah. if you if you just want. I yeah. mean, they, yes, you can't do it all, but uh, there is so much to learn and so 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 many cool things. Yeah. So it's still worth it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. This is how have you hacked far into other things apart from the spectrum? Well, I I, I did a lot with the PC uh, yeah. a few years back, and then nowadays uh, I. Use do two different, completely different things. Mm -hmm. um, I spend time trying to understand a little bit better how computers work, like let's say under the level of languages. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you say run something in Ruby? Well, there is a you know virtual machine that run, is running under it. So how does that work? Mm -hmm. And does it have uh, an intermediate language? Can we write code in that language? Yeah. You know, and, and this kind of things. So I, I did it a lot with uh, .NET, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the language that I used until uh, maybe six months ago. And then I changed my job, and with that, I, I, I was actually you know, in my spare time was writing code directly in uh, <laughs> in uh, MSIL, yeah. uh, which is which is interesting because it's it's a nice machine language. Mm. It's, it's well done, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's a weird it's a weird hybrid between a machine language and object oriented. Mm. It's an object-oriented assembly. I don't know how to. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one. So you can do things like create an instance of an object, mm -hmm. and you can do things like make virtual calls, you know, which you can not. Can, so yeah. you, you don't call. You call the method whatever foo of an object, but uh, going through the uh, double dispatch table. <laughs> so it, it, it's interesting. Ah. <laughs> but then you do you know pushes and and pops and, and you know move and whatever yeah. and jumps and, and, and you don't have anything else well, no security well there is there is the you're in, inside the world garden right yeah, yeah, the yeah. Machines, but, be, but beyond that no not the same type of security as you have you no no you can do you, yeah you can do really really bad stuff but well, most bad stuff ends up in crashes ah, yeah perfect. yeah so it's that's pretty good yeah uh, for example if you exit from a routine but you haven't cleaned up your stack. This is the kind of stuff that yeah. gets caught at runtime. Uh, but uh, for example, not on the spectrum. Yeah. I was I was writing machine language for the presentation, yeah. and it was so hideous. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, okay, if something works, it works. If it doesn't work, what do you do? Yeah. I mean, there are no debuggers, and the computer just hangs. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah, it's nicer to be on the .NET virtual machine. <laughs> yeah, so so in there you just need to look at the code and reread it and understand why. Yeah. And I lost like half an hour because I didn't remember that if you decrement a a large register, so BC register, then the flags are not set. Mm. And if you decrement a smaller register like A, then they are. <laughs> and so <laughs> the loop wasn't working. The loop wasn't working. Why? Why? Yeah. Why? And then I had to look up the documentation. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> of, of the actual machine language. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a bit weird. Do you have to, like, put in a lot of work to be able to, like, write and run uh, MSIL, for example? No, 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 no. You, you, you literally write a, you know, a, a file, a test file, a source file. Um, I think you have to add in a little header, but re really a minor thing. And that's it. And then, and then everything comes uh, with .NET. Yeah. So, so, so it's, it's fairly easy. Yeah. It's fairly easy. And I guess stuff like that will remain open as well because the people who develop these things want these features to be there, want to test these things. And well, it's it's useful, right? Because yeah, uh, uh, the the virtual machine needs to be tested and needs to be used. 
So it, yeah. you don't want to depend on another layer if you're working at, at that lower yeah. level. So that's why it's there. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that people actually write code <laughs> uh, with that. It's just tedious and long. Yeah. So yeah. there isn't really a case for... No, there is. There is. Uh, not for doing it like that. that no. Like that is crazy. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I used it in, in more than one occasion with my colleagues at Stack Overflow. Uh, when you really need speed and you need to do things to speed up uh, very, very hot parts. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you, let's say you receive, okay, the classic example is you want to deserialize an object. Yeah. And, um, you know, you can either do it dynamically, so you read the incoming text and then create an object, blah, 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 which is slow. Yeah. Or you can create a function or a lambda that does it for you uh, once a structure, the structure is known, it, it just generates the code yeah. as you would write yeah. it. And uh, of course, if you do that, you don't really want to write C sharp, no. because then how do you compile it, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so you, you write directly IL, which yeah. can be run instantly. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so you, you basically do create new Lambda, and then Lambda emits uh, these instructions, yeah. and there is, there is a way in .NET of doing that. So yeah. yeah. So you generate your code for your own use and then then run it. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. used is used uh, in pretty much all the JSON serializer and serializers, uh -huh. uh, all the ones you can find. Uh -huh. uh, it's used in uh, in our ORM, for example, when you want to map objects, uh -huh. um, and then we used it to uh, we have our own search engine. For, for the questions mm -hmm. and some features needed to scan every time 50 million questions mm -hmm. and we wanted to return in you know sub second yeah so, <laughs> yeah yeah. So that's it was, a yeah it was really hot yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. so yeah so that's that's why I started using it where I started learning it mm -hmm. and then it was fun you know just yeah uh, it reminded me of the old days so. yeah <laughs> Yeah, and has it uh, affected how you look at your higher level code? Does it make you think about it? Absolutely, about absolutely, it? yes. I mean, you have. To, I, mean, I, I don't know any other way to code right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people say you have to code for legibility, you have to code for maintainability, mm -hmm. but ultimately you have to code for the machine, and that's yeah, that's, that's what true. you're doing, right? <laughs> that's 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 your job, and I find that uh, knowing how stuff uh, gets run under the hood informs your choices much better. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and it also lets you avoid a lot of things which are non-obvious. And one of the things that I talked about is how hacking works, you know, and the fact that you, you sort of blow off uh, of one of abstraction and you say, I I'm cheating you, yeah. you know, you, you keep on thinking of one abstraction, but then one level higher. Yeah. And I can do things you can, cannot even think. Yeah. It also works the other way. You can be one level lower. Mm -hmm. and, and when you do that, and when you, when you think about these things, you realize, for example, that your nice and very readable uh, link expression, for example, which is you know, fantastic, functional, and very clear, yeah. is suddenly creating two million, two million <laughs> instances yeah. of a class because he needs to do that. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and that's not very intuitive. I mean, no. You don't see it. You know, it's implicit. You don't see it no. in your code. So you may have written some very readable code and maintainable, but it sucks and you don't yeah. know why. It doesn't perform. It. It, it doesn't perform and it's also, you know, it creates a problem for the next guy. Yeah. And so you, do, you shouldn't do that. So you need to think about this kind of things when you're writing coding, which in practice means how is that compiled? No. You know? Is, does that have a closure? Does that have, you know, some nasty <laughs> in, in there? And, and I find that specifically the more functional bits, they become really, really hard to keep in, in your own head and understand how they're going to perform. Yeah. So sometimes you just need to try it out. Yeah, and see what and happens. See, and see. But, but that's one of the things, you know, um, I, I look for. Uh, performance, but performance also in... in for me, it doesn't mean just a number that gets as low as, low as possible, but it's something which is performed in the right way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and so in the way that I, I expect it to, to, to do, you know, yeah. some stupid thing. 
<laughs> yeah, it can be fast by being strange. <laughs> and, yeah. And then you can't reason about it anyway. Yeah, I really liked your expression, like hacking as, as you said, transcending abstractions. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a much more like positive and uh, thought provoking way of thinking about it than. Well, hacking is always positive. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, like anything, you can do it for good or for evil. Yeah, yeah sure. I consider it a positive attitude, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's just like playing with toys. Yeah. And uh, also, I have a, a mathematical sort of background, and it reminds me a lot of uh, things um, like logic. You know, in logic, you have uh, uh, Russell's barber. You know, and that's another example of say hacking logic, right? So Russell's barber is this hypothetical barber that shaves everyone that does not shave himself. Mm -hmm. And the question is, does he shave himself? Because, you know, he doesn't have an answer. Yeah. And, you know, you can solve this by stepping out of the toy system that logic provides and seeing, okay, of course it shaves itself. Right? Or, of course not. Or you don't know, it doesn't yeah. matter. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't sound so paradoxical if you think about it, not as a pet case, but a, an actual person in an actual place. Yeah. I don't know. I had shades itself, so it doesn't. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. You know? <laughs> but but it's, it's those kind of paradoxes that you can all, only solve by stepping out of the level of abstractions mm -hmm. that you're in. Uh, Gödel incompleteness theorem is another example. The fact that you say, well, you know, you put it together some axioms and there are going to be some unprovable theorems. Yeah. Uh, and if you actually look at how it makes that demonstration, it's all about that. It, it makes a, a meta programming. Mm -hmm. he, he, he says, okay, uh, let me uh, enumerate all the possible theorems so he can, he can write a formula that refers to itself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, that again, that's a form of hacking. It's yeah. hacking logic, right? Yeah. And it's always the same. Uh, hacking works like that, you know, by, by, by playing around with the levels. Yeah, yeah, thinking outside of the box, in yeah. the outer box. Or yeah, like and, and I, find, I find that it, it's nice. Uh, down, going down deep is, is much easier. Yeah. It, it is where all the fun is. Uh, yeah, going outside is like, yeah, add more abstractions. Yeah. <laughs> where does it, where does well, it but, but, uh, for example, a lot of hackers do, you know, hack people instead of hacking the system yeah, instead yeah. of people. So that's that's a, a, probably a way of going upwards. Uh, yeah, I, don't I know, guess. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> then, yeah. it doesn't really make any sense. I mean, we're just using here yeah, yeah, uh, metaphors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what happens. With, they break sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's good. It's good. I think it's good practice for every every developer to think about these things and. You know, how can I break this? You know, yeah, um, and like I can move to a different level, and what happens then? Yeah, because that was also something I started thinking about. Thanks to this, again, I, I've thought about it from other directions, but this whole thing about how far we are from the hardware, and mm -hmm. how often we are, and how by not grasping the levels very much, I wonder what we're missing out on, or what, what we could do if we knew more about the hardware. Or, could perhaps use it more when we, yeah. when we know, know it's there. It's maybe you can use more the hardware, but even if you if you look at other things, um, let's say, let me give you another example, right? So where where I work, uh, there is a team uh, that is mostly working on integrating systems, mm -hmm. right? So for example, we may be using uh, Grafana yeah. or whatever, and we need to we we want to integrate those systems with Slack, mm -hmm. which is our main yeah. chat and our main nervous system. Uh, Toptal is a completely remote company, yeah. so it doesn't have offices, our office is Slack. And, and so if you want to make something very visible, you integrate it with, uh, with Slack. Yep. But many of these apl external applications that we use don't have, even have a APIs. Ah. So in many cases, they have to basically hack something together mm -hmm. and they, they use I don't know, Selenium, <laughs> and they create their own, their own <laughs> APIs uh, yeah. on top of uh, web applications. Yeah. And that's a way, a way of, you know, hacking again. Yeah, and that's, I guess that's hacking up in abstraction. Yeah, yeah, down. yeah, perhaps, so, yes. And uh, yes, it's, yeah, it's a bit like social engineering, right? In a way. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you pretend to be a human. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and, but if they didn't do that, we wouldn't have 
those integrations. No, and then you have an API that's nice and well formed. You can use yeah. that. Of course, they're hacky. Of course, yeah, they yeah. break all the time. Of course, they do. Yeah, yeah, but, they but, but we have it. Yeah. Right? It's good. So, so that's why that mentality is good, you know. And, you know, they're maybe because they are most, most of them are Eastern European. They just don't care. You know? <laughs> yeah, just want oh, I just want to do this. Okay, let's do yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. yes. I can see a way here. Let me push it. <laughs> yes. It worked. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't work tomorrow, but let me get it. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's fascinating. As I remember, yeah, it must, it must have been when I left the Amiga and went, started like playing games on PCs mm-hmm. and this whole performance race was going on. And I actually remember thinking about it even back then that, wait a minute, I'm, a new graphic card comes out every year and the games try to take advantage of that. It means that no one really learns how to get the most out of this year's graphics card because next year's is coming already. Yeah. But back in the more fixed machines and maybe on the consoles, people can actually take the time to really get to know this hardware and yeah. get the most out of it. Yeah, I think it's, it's like that nowadays, right? It, 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 the, the good games for a console, they don't come in the first year, they come in the second yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. When people actually start to stretch... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, of course, and and, and that's what they do. I mean, yeah. uh, but uh, I think they're at least maybe not in the last few years, but I think there is a lot going on in that. uh, There was even at the time of maybe Quake, for example. Mm -hmm. There's a fantastic uh, series of articles that was appearing on Doctor Dobbs. Hmm. Uh, written by the guy by Carmack and hmm. the other guy uh, Michael Labrash, ah. and with the guys who designed the engine and the kind of hacks they did were they were fantastic. Yeah. Uh, they they coded so they hand coded the assembly so to interle- interleave floating point operations and and fixed point operations <laughs> because doing that made all the calls work in parallel. Oh yeah, so, so we get extra. big win. <laughs> yes, and then and then they would choose, you know, uh, yeah, we we're gonna move this this calculation over to the floating point, which theoretically would be slower, but practically would balance out. Uh, and so, because it was it was so almost impossible to make a game like Wake at the time yeah. on that hardware, so pushing they push it. Yeah. Yeah. But I I'm pretty sure that the same happens today somehow. I, ho- I hope so. I mean, on, on consoles, I, I bet it does a little bit more. But well, who knows, right? Yeah. Because uh, now there are there are pretty established gaming uh, gaming engines, right? There is Unreal, and there is the other one, Unity. Yeah. And I think a lot of the pushing happens maybe inside yeah, those games. Yeah, that's true. They have the time to actually do it. Yeah, but I, I think a lot of uh, at another level, a lot of hacking, for example, must be happening in World of Warcraft. Oh, which sounds okay. sounds ridiculous, right? Well, but uh, if you think about it, they have a what? Both a ten-year-old gaming system. I'm sure they change it, they tweak it, but yeah. they are constrained by the fact that they have all the all the content of ten years ago still running. Yeah. And um, and so they need to do more shiny things, better things, and so on. We always with the same APIs. Yeah, yeah, so I'm pretty sure that those APIs have been hacked, you know, by the by the developer <laughs> in point. some in, yeah yeah. And they still have the same system because they still have the same defects they had ten yeah. years ago. Like every Tuesday, they need to reset all the, all the servers really? uh, manually, and they literally turn them on and off to, to upgrade them. So yeah, it's easy to get stuck in something. Yeah, I guess. I mean, whenever you have sufficient sufficiently large server based applications, I guess you can get into these levels of hacking as well. Yeah, and have the have enough value in pushing down or pushing up or whatever yeah. it may be. And another fantastic hack was the, the one that Google did with uh, with their servers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they looked at the numbers and they decided, well, you know, if you build a container of servers which are cheap enough, you know, we put a bunch of them, then, you know, most of the stuff is like very parallel, so yeah. we don't care. And uh, if they break, we don't fix that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one would think, well, why don't you fix that? It's cheaper, yeah, right? Yeah. But it's just not worth it. No. You know, it just too is, you know. Yeah, it hurts a little bit to think about it, but yeah. Yeah. I can see where they're com- coming from. Yeah. But again, thinking about the different level of abstraction, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah but that's, that's money hacking, if you like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, what is it? Backblaze is doing a sort of other hack where they sometimes they go around and buy hard drives uh, for their storage pod for, for everyone's backups. 
Okay. And some periods where there's a high demand and low availability of new drives, they they like rented trucks and gone around the US and like had their employees buy whatever they were allowed to from like, all the best buys and sending it back because yeah, the calculation works out and we need the drives. <laughs> yes, fantastic. Yeah. But I, I also feel that this kind of thinking is very common in startups. And then mm -hmm. it sort of gets lost yeah, yeah. as the companies grow. Yeah. And, you know, my job nowadays, I am like a 50% of my time, I'm a coder. Mm -hmm. The other 50%, I help other people code. Mm -hmm. I'm an engineering manager. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, inspiring people from this point of view is, is very important to yeah. me. You know, making them understand how they can level up as developers. Yeah. Because so many get stuck in, you know, these are the rules, you know, this, this is how you cook. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lie. Yeah. There is no school. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> Look at it from the outside. Oh, I don't want to. I like my box. <laughs> yes. Do you find it hard to balance between the two? If you do like 50% development and 50%? No. No, no. Not at all. Well. I mean, of course, you need to manage your time correctly. Yeah. But that's the only, the only thing, right? Um, but no. I, I do a lot of open source and loot a lot of code inside the company as, as needed. Yeah. So I keep myself happy and you know, given that I need to I, I, I have limited time and I sort of can pick and choose what I do, yeah. which is an advantage actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was just asking because I have some friends who are in uh, well I, I, I was going to say like recently got into management positions, but they've been in them for a while now, but they, they seem to have a hard time like deciding because I think they, they really want to keep coding as much as they can, but mm -hmm. they obviously see a point in being in the management position as well. And they do good stuff on that management side as well, I can tell from yeah. what they're talking about. But they seem to have a hard time finding the balance or sort of balancing. I guess, yeah, it's, they, it's, it's difficult, but uh, everything was clear to me because in, in the past I've been, I've been a pure manager mm -hmm. for some time, for eight, nine months. Yeah. And it was terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, I was always out of the loop. I never understood what the hell was going on. Yeah. And, you know, the less you could, the more, the less uh, relevant you, you are. Yeah. And especially with developers, they don't care about you. Yeah. And, and so I, it was terrible. I hated that. And I said, I can never, I will never be that again. Then I, I always mixed up some technical. So I was either technical lead or architect and I never accepted any, any other thing. Yeah. And this is new job that I, I started nine months ago. It has this management part, and I was very nervous. Mm -hmm. But uh, the company is, is a great company. They let me do whatever I want yeah. from this point of view. So I, I think I balance it out now with, with knowledge that I yeah. need to code. Otherwise, I, I suffer, and my, the quality of my management suffers. Yeah. Perhaps perhaps the, the secret might be to do, do what you did and actually do all management for a while because then you really know how terrible it feels and then <laughs> perhaps then they perhaps they find the strength to like find the balance and be happy with it like I need this balance and now I can push for it because I know so a, lot, a lot of the struggle that people have is okay so if you don't can't code 100% of the time mm. in a company it's really hard to code part time yeah because you don't have enough you know involvement and, yeah, yeah, yeah. or people can't count really count on you for yeah, balance, yeah exactly yeah. so that's that's a struggle mm -hmm. But I sort of go around that uh, by coding other stuff. So if I if I cannot do this, and I need to remain relevant, so it's part of my job to code anyways, and I do open source, for example. Mm. And and that allows me to, to sort of get my fix in yeah. a way, or, or remain relevant and then and then be a, an engineering manager. But then if you know, good stuff comes around where I am, so I can sort of drop in without breaking sort of deadlines that, yeah. and stuff. I always do that. Yeah. I always do that. Or in a lot of cases, I can help uh, on specifics, like maybe on performance or on some hard problems uh, that you know maybe my my expertise is useful. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. But not because I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try the next few months to be more hands-on, even more hands-on. Yeah. So be just a regular developer for most of my time to see yeah. how how that works. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. This has been super interesting. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Marco. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for having me. Let me put it this way, Mr. Amer. 
The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. No 9000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. We are all, by any practical definition of the words, foolproof and incapable of error.